Warm welcome to everybody to the, the panel on our panel is titled with an open-ended question and it says education for the future disruption or question mark my name is Mirella Oprea and I am honored to moderate this panel today. As a behavior change advisor with Warvision International, one of the quick key questions for me these days on the topic of education is what are those behaviors that we need to adopt as teachers, as policymakers, as parents that will create positive educational experiences for children in spite of what is currently happening in the world? At the same time, as the founder of the Dream Management Movement in Romania, I'm constantly thinking about how the educational system can not only support children with their learning journeys in the times of the current pandemic, but also how it can help them identify and achieve their dreams and aspirations. As per the announced agenda, the panel aims at delivering answers to the following questions. We have five main questions for today. The first of these questions is, what elements should be part of an education for resilience and resilient societies? The second one is, how is the future of education interwoven to the future of work? What are the necessary skills for a professional in the next 20 years and how can they be delivered in a most effective manner in a world disrupted by technology? The fourth question is STEM or STEAM, adding arts and humanities. So, and the final question is, which way forward for bridging the gap in education uh, between countries, regions, social, um, uh, social strata, and so on? So today, I will invite the panelists to bring their wisdom at this virtual table and share with us their thoughts around these five questions. So let me first quickly introduce the panelists. First, we have Mr. Dragos Tudorake. Hi, uh, Mr. Tudorake, um, who worked in, in international fora like the UN and the EU for over 20 years on issues ranging from prosecution of war crimes to external relations, migration policy, and, and Schengen issues. He was a member of the Romanian parliament as head of chancellor and minister of interior. And at the time being, he is a member of the European Parliament and, and among other roles, he is the chair of the special committee on artificial intelligence in a digital um, age. Then we are going to have Margareta Kesaru. Welcome, Margareta. Hello. <laughs> Um, she is leading the public affairs and public policy activities in UiPath. She has an extensive background in public policy, legal and regulatory affairs. In her current role, she is bringing her energy into shaping a multi-stakeholder dialogue on the role of um, artificial intelligence and automation technologies in the context of the digital economy. Margareta represents uh, UiPath in various trade and industry associations, including the American Chamber of Commerce up to the European Union, where she holds the important role of vice chair in the future work, education and skills um, task force. Then we have Roxana Voiku Dorobanzu. Mrs. Dorobanzu, welcome to the panel. Hi. Um, she is an associate uh, professor at the uh, uh, Bucharest University of Economic Studies while being involved in various business projects in an advisory capacity. Um, Ms., uh, Mrs. Dorobanzu holds a PhD in international business and economics and has taught international business and finance and risk management in the UK, Poland, Poland and Romania. Finally, but not least, we are uh, going to hear from uh, Simona Iftimescu, Mrs. Iftimescu, who is an experienced, hi Simona, <laughs> who is an experienced educational professional 
working as researcher and lecturer at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences at the University of Bucharest. Simona is also Secretary General of the Romanian Educational Research Association and Director of the Roadwell Center for Children, Children's Wellbeing. Simona has a double BA in psychology and so um, dear participants and those who are uh, listening to this uh, uh, panel, you see we have such a wide range of skills, experiences and knowledge gathered in this panel and I'm uh, very happy that we could we were able to bring all this um, wonderful uh, panelists together. Without further ado, I would like to um, turn to you, Mr. Uh, Tudorake, and uh, give the floor to you, not before mentioning that what we want to do is to open the floor for initial thoughts and, and, and insights from each of the uh, four members of the panel for let's take each of us like five minutes or six or seven. And after we hear from each of you a round of uh, initial thoughts, we are going to then uh, open it for the public for questions and reflections. So this is what I propose and Mr. Todorake, you have the floor for a first round of your insights. Uh, thank you very much Mirela um, and thanks to Aspen Institute for inviting me to, to Bucharest Forum. Uh, a forum which, uh, look at us, we are holding online. Uh, it's a first, just like everything else that we've been doing for the last eight months, uh, moving our lives, personal and professional, uh, online. And that brings me to the first point that I want to make in my introduction. Um, and I guess this is also why, why you invited me to this particular panel on education, which is my experience now uh, working as the chair of the AI Special Committee in the European Parliament and, and having focused uh, over the last few months in the start of this, since the start of the mandate in the European Parliament on, on the digital transformation and AI in particular. Um, so why do I want to start with this? Because I think that this is one of the key, uh, key factors in the fundamental change that I do believe uh, education will need to go through uh, in the following decades. Because education not only has to, uh, but it is part of the evolution of, of society uh, and has to follow what happens in economy, uh, in our lives, uh, whether personal or, or professional. So, um, digitalization is transforming everything. Uh, and if ever we doubted that, again, the, the last nine months demonstrated that in full. Uh, and it means that digitalization will change the way our jobs will look like in the future. And there will be jobs in 10 years time, in 15 years time, that we don't even know the title of right now. Um, and right now our children are certainly not learning the skills and not, not acquiring the expertise for the jobs of 15 years from now. But at the same time, and I think this is a, one of the fundamental precepts that I want to put on the table today, I'm not one of those that believe that, oh my God, uh, technology, uh, the transformation that digital uh, is bringing into our societies, artificial intelligence, is going to take us out of the workforce altogether. No. Uh, believe it or not, and like it or not, we are still going to be around having to work uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, and 100 years from now. So we're not rid of working. It's only that we have to understand that what happens in the digital transformation is something that we need to reflect in the way we're going to educate ourselves and also educate our children and also prepare the generations that come for that sort of a transformation. So that is the first thing that I want to put on the table. Now, another element is that if we look at our children, and I look at mine, they already have new patterns of thinking. Patterns of thinking that I don't have, that we don't have. My children are able to work out how to use a smartphone 10 times faster than I do. Why? Because I think that their brains are by now even differently wired so that they can actually more intuitively 
go into the uh, and almost almost uh, naturally replicate how the machine actually is built to think and act. And again, this is a reality that we have to grasp because we have to adapt the education of tomorrow to the reality again of how the new generations think. The second issue that I want to put on the table is this new set of skills. What do they mean? What, what, what kind of skills are we talking about? And again, if we look at the kind of jobs we do right now and the output that we get out of the jobs, there are certain jobs that require a certain type of logic, others that require less uh, logic, uh, some more intellectual processing, some less. I think what is something that will be inevitable in the future is that the ability to connect dots, to have rational abilities of connecting different stimuli is something that will be inherent in almost every job that will be there available on the market. Why? Because a lot of the uh, less intensive in terms of logical thinking type of jobs will be done by machines. That is clear. So in a way, what we have to do when we project the future of our education systems is to see how we can build those skills that are making everyone, no matter the environment where they come from, that are making everyone able to, uh, to acquire those skills and then to deploy them in the, in the uh, labor market. So what, a little bit more, what kind of skills do I see? I see, first of all, critical thinking, essential. I see the ability to process data, the ability to make out uh, good data from bad data, valid data from invalid data, the ability to make quick decisions, optimize decisions, be agile, be adaptive. These, these are the skills of tomorrow, from my point of view, and these are the skills that we have to put in the minds uh, and in the souls of our, of our children if we want them to be adapt to the transformations in the, in the economies, in the labor market, in everything else that we do. Um, there is, however, something, there's a difference, speaking also of, the, of, the, of one of your questions as to the role of arts. <laughs> While I do believe that a lot of the jobs of the future will be linked to digital and that the digital will be forcing us into all of the things that I said earlier, I don't think that this ability that we have as humans to, to, to put our heart into things will disappear. On the contrary, I think the more uniformity at some point will be achieved with acquiring digital skills and being able to deploy them into the, world, into the jobs of, of the future, I think the competitive edge will come from those that are able to do both, to actually uh, be able to perform according to those new digital realities, but at the same time retain that humanity that makes us what we are. And that I don't think will be ever taken away from us by, by anyone, not by the machines, not by artificial intelligence, not by, not by anybody. So even, or, or just like it is today, those that would be able to combine social skills, empathy, the ability to understand and reach out to others, uh, the ability to entertain others, the ability to sing, to write, to compose, and combine them with the digital skills that are essential uh, in tomorrow's society, I think those will be the ones that will hold the competitive edge. So this sort of dual specialization, if I would call it that way, digital versus, versus humanities and, and arts, is, I think, something that will complete the, 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 the model uh, in terms of education and the profile of, of the next generation's individuals. And, and I want to, to add two more things, uh, because I didn't want to talk only about digital and, and the digital transformation. There are two other elements that I think are essential in tomorrow's education. I would actually consider them essential in today's education as well, but since I don't see them very much, I would like to at least put them forward for the future. The first is understanding teaching democracy. Um, I think we're ignoring how seriously, deeply problematic it is today, the fact that most of our citizens are losing trust in, and confidence in the state, in the authorities of the mm -hmm. state. And not only here in Romania, it is valid everywhere else. 
And I think that the, the, the lesser understanding our societies, our individuals have in, in how the state works, in, in, in what democracy is and how it functions, uh, the more we run the risk that at some point the, the, the social moral fabric of our society risks to break. And I think that we, we have a duty to put that as part of the curricula of, of today and of the future, because we have to educate our children on, on what democracy is, what it brings. We don't have the same, uh, the, the same factors as our, our parents had, as our grandparents had. We don't have a big war that, that has taught us the hard way, the importance of liberty, mm. freedom. We, we, we don't have communism anymore as part of our experiences in the past to teach us again the value of, of, of individual freedoms. And because we don't have these, these stimuli, we have to teach them. It's as simple as that. So um, again, I, I would like to add that into, into the mix. And, and last but not least um, is entrepreneurship, um, mm. which is a concept that I don't think is, is sufficiently defined and understood. Uh, and also I think it's ignored in terms of how important it is. And it doesn't mean that you have to learn how to open a business. I think it's, it's, it, it is a false, false understanding that, that, that entrepreneurship means uh, uh, businesses or the private sector. No, it's not about that. Entrepreneurship means the courage to think, the courage to, to, to take up an idea, the courage to invest in that idea, the courage to, to, to put it to pieces and, and rationalize mm -hmm. what you want to do with it, the courage to, to, or the ability to find resources to, to, to put behind your idea, so on and so forth. And I think that this spirit of entrepreneurship is something that we also have to put as part of our curricula if we want to, to, to have a generation that is adapted to the challenges of tomorrow. So I'll stop here as an introduction. Uh, thanking you again very much for the invitation. I look forward to the to the Q. &A. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tudorake. While you were speaking so passionately and so interestingly about your insights in relation to this important topic today, I was looking at the other panelists. You know, I have this good habit of spying on my panelists. <laughs> and I was looking and, and, and uh, noticing how uh, Margareta, Mr., Mrs. Casaru, uh, was nodding at you at, uh, in, at, at repeated times, particularly when uh, you mentioned mentioned the, the importance of uh, digitalization and how this should be married, however, with all the humanities and arts and so on. And also, I noticed, I'm not sure if I really caught you, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Iftimescu, when Mr. Tudorake mentioned the role of empathy and compassion. But I assume that you, as a psychologist or a researcher in the field of psychology, uh, you might have caught this as an important element of uh, Mr. Tudorake's speech. So um, I guess that there are many insights that we can already build on, uh, uh, starting from what Mr. Tudorake um, was saying. And I'm curious about uh, your insights, uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Kesaru, right now, and how you would uh, relay and build on what uh, Mr. Tudorake was mentioning, but also what are your um, original and um, unique um, uh, insights into the conversation. Thank you so much. Indeed, I was nodding a lot because a lot of the, the points that uh, Mr. Todorakia made, I also wanted to, to share today. So I will, I will reflect on those in a minute. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind invitation and for this, this great panel and, the, and this, this space. Uh, the topics are extremely timely and important and, and it's an honor to, to be here. So I'm a public affairs and policy manager at, at UiPath. And for those that do not know uh, UiPath, uh, in a few words, UiPath is a company that uh, was established in, in Romania by two Romanian founders in 2005 on the premises of uh, Deskover. And now uh, UiPath is a global company that provides complete software platform for robotic process automation to help organiza organizations of all sizes um, whether they're for profit, uh, public sector, um, you name it, to efficiently automate their business processes. So we, when we talk about automation in this particular, the particular case, we don't talk about those traditional robots that stand in, in factories. We talk about software robots. We talk about digital assistants. Digital assistants that can help us throughout the day 
with our high uh, workloads, with our repetitive mundane tasks that are in high volume, especially now during COVID-19, I think especially the public sector was um, receiving a lot of inquiries that uh, you know were needed to be processed in such a such a short time in order to be efficient, like the stimulus packages, the and, and other forms of of relief. Now, think about uh, digital assistants as those robots that you can have every day and can help you with the computer tasks. So basically, everywhere we have a computer, where where we operate with a computer, and where we have rule-based, high-volume task, there is an opportunity for automation. And uh, why is that? Well, we envision a world with a robot for every person. And uh, the, the main outcome would be that in, if we have this, this platform, if we have this help by digital assistants, we as, you, as humans can have our potential accelerated. So like, like it was said before, uh, if we give these, these tasks that, uh, uh, that can be performed by digital assistants, we have more time for empathy, creativity, decision-making, strategic thinking, the things that make us human in the end. So this is you know, our main purpose. Uh, so the power of automation can be really harnessed by everyone. I'm gonna talk about that, as I said, by businesses, governments, individuals, and, uh, and this is uh, an important part of our effort to democratize access to this technology. So a part of our democratization efforts, we talk about uh, education. And education lies very close to our heart uh, at UiPath. Mm. We built uh, the company with, with the focus on education. So the importance of getting those materials, courses close to people so that they can learn what automation is, they can you know, follow a career in that direction or just become citizens developers as we, we call them, people that own the process and that automate uh, part of their processes at work. Um, now, what else I wanted to share is that obviously in, in this new world, digital and technological upskilling is critical to building the workforce of tomorrow and, and today, actually, um, and, and, and as part of the, the learning programs, we work with, with students, we work with uh, workers, we work with institutions, academia, research institutions, uh, workforce training organizations, which is part of that multi-stakeholder approach that I, that I uh, have actually in my biography. So this multi-stakeholder approach, I think is an essential, essential part of how we prepare ourselves for the future of work. Now, going back to the questions, um, I'm going to touch upon uh, two or three of them quickly. The elements uh, quickly, quickly. <laughs> quickly. The elements that should be part of an education for resilience and, and resilient society. So, I want to leave like four major important points because we all have seen uh, the pace of adoption of new technology in the education systems with COVID-19, and it has hit everyone, including parents, students, teachers, all were involved. Four major points. Learning continuity, improving digital infrastructure, so access, increasing access to technology, increasing digital skills and digital literacy, arts, humanities, and communication, and creativity, because it, it will be part of our uh, human potential that we will be enabled and not uh, least modernizing and adapting curriculum. Something else that I want to add is that the educational systems need to become digital themselves in order to take part in this important conversation. Now, something else about the future of work and how it can you know, be coupled with what's happening on the education front. We really need to change the paradigm. So the old study work retire paradigm is now becoming lifelong learning because everything is changing so fast. So the skills that we, 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 we need to uh, develop need to give us that, that room for uncertainty and, and, and you know, make us feel more curious, um, make us take on that uh, self-led learning path. So relying also on, on ourselves to, to, to take on that path. And going back to multi-stakeholder approach, it is really important for all the stakeholders to collaborate and to think about new ways of transferring know-how from one place to another. Whether we talk about um, online learning platforms, courses, materials, apprenticeships developed by the public, 
uh, by the private sector, if they are coupled with public sector efforts, you, you have a different, completely different and better outcome. Um, so I think uh, this, this maps it all in a sentence, um, in, in a few sentences. Uh, the last point that I want to make is that entrepreneurship and innovation needs to become part of, of everything coupled with, with digital because these, these uh, important skills will, will make room for progress, uh, growth and, and success in the future. And leaving no one behind is extremely important as well. So we need also to have dedicated efforts for disadvantaged families and for uh, situations where there is a digital divide. It's important to, to have an inclusive approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Cassaro. Fantastic insights. And uh, I, it was so interesting to, to hear how you have built on Mr. Tudorakis' uh, points and added uh, new, very fascinating aspects. And one of the things that caught my idea, my, my, my imagination, was this thing about um, the study work retire model, which needs to be uh, fundamentally transformed for the future uh, as how the, the future future of work seems to be. Um, again, I was looking at um, the faces of the other panelists and everybody was, was nodding at you. And it seems that even nature out there, we could hear a, um, a dog who apparently was also uh, nodding at you and agreeing with you vocally. <laughs> And I wanted to mention uh, him so that uh, we have the first uh, round of uh, universal consensus. I'm joking, of course. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm trying to um, pass the message to our um, to those who are uh, participating in this paneling, this panel, listening to us, and invite them to send us their initial thoughts and questions for each of the panelists. So uh, let me iterate this. We are looking forward for work, your questions. Preferably, please be brief and mention already the person that you want your question uh, to be answered by, so that we go then very, very quickly. Now, I'm going to um, uh, move the focus of the conversation on um, Professor Dorobansu. Uh, I was um, uh, thinking while uh, Mrs. Casaro was uh, uh, was talking and and looking at at your uh, visual cues. I was like, this uh, the next intervention is going to be enormously uh, interesting and fascinating. So over to you and um, Mrs. Eftimescu, just a little bit more of patience <laughs> and then we are going to reach you as well. Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Drobanzo. Thank you so much. You know, there's no pressure in the fact that you're expecting some awesome intervention from my part. <laughs> Absolutely no pressure. Never. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come back to, to a conversation that the Aspen Institute has started on the future of work for the past years. I mean, this topic has showed up in the Bucharest Forum uh, throughout throughout its nine years of existence, and I'm glad that it it appeared here today. Now, to touch briefly on on the elements that were also presented, because the feeling is that we are all on the same vision, but uh, one issue would be how to turn this very nice vision that everybody agrees upon into reality. And we saw the uh, throughout this pandemic, the extreme need for a change in mindset, not necessarily about the things that we teach, but how we teach and how we teach for why we teach. What's the role of the teacher? Are we shifting from the sole deliverer of knowledge to a guide? And if we are to shift to becoming a guide, what are the skills that the teacher will have to learn or relearn? Where are we positioning ourselves in collaboration to our students? The students may be of any age. What's the common dictionary that we have between generations, between industries, between policymakers and policy um, beneficiaries? What are um, 
and throughout my my uh, experience both as a teacher and also in the in the private sector what i could notice was the lack of common dictionary between the it people and the rest of the world the fact that we talk about the same concepts but not really so uh, all those skills that that mr tudorake presented the fact that we have to have critical thinking we have to be creative are necessary also to be able to have this common dictionary because we cannot have a conversation that drives things forward without understanding and talking on the same topics we talk about automation we talk about digitalization and digital transformation we all agree that that would be bring competitiveness value added progress and so on and so forth there's no contest on that but the thing is do we all know what we're talking about because if you go to some rural area and you ask a teacher what does digital transformation mean they're going to say the fact that they use a tablet instead of you know or a computer in in house instead of the usual coming and sharing with the kids but there's so much more than that and uh that would be one way you know to to reshape the fact that this conversation about the future of work will have to start as a real conversation in which all the participants all the multi stakeholder stakeholders that that margareta was mentioning know what they're talking about we all agree on a vision do we really know what that vision is we're talking and there's the conversation right now at european level about algorithmic governance which sounds awesome do we really understand what that entitles for us as citizens for us as policymakers uh it's not just about the concepts it's not just about you know training ourselves on whatever word means but it's about learning how technology can be a tool and not a driver in itself so uh the the education for the future will have to start with a large question how do we want that future to be do we want it to be inclusive in which case what are the skills towards that inclusivity do we want it to be democratic as as mr todorake mentioned what are the skills towards that driving that democracy forward what are what are the elements so it's like switching the conversation from you know a chessboard to a 5d chessboard in which you have to consider all these elements if i were to deliver one skill that my ante um, speakers did not mention would be the ability to zoom in and to zoom out the fact that any student of any age will have to be able to look competently at a single thing know how to use a whole different uh, platform maybe zoom or google meets or you know last year at the forum we had no idea what zoom is um and i'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing but working on that also the ability to zoom out how will this change my life 5 years from now 10 years from now do i really need to become proficient in zoom or is it just a tool you know like a life that i'm learning uh and because i'm going to pass the 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 floor <laughs> i'm going to leave it to the moderator but um one one last element would be we will have to take really care about the separation the boundary between work and life because one thing that this pandemic has taught was that all this distancing all this digital transformation comes with psychological effects on the learners on the teachers on the collaborators that we did not envisage so far so i'm glad that simona will will follow up on this uh because she's definitely more competent than than me thank you so much thank you so much professor derabanza so you see i was right in having those expectations from your speech because you included a very interesting element i um, my attention was um, very much caught by this idea okay we have a vision first of all do we do we all have the same understanding of the vision and then how do we implement that vision i think that um this is a, a crucial element and i am going to want to come back uh at the towards the end of the conversation to 
to look um, at what role might uh, the European Parliament, other multilateral institutions, uh, the business sector like uh, the UI Pass company represented here, the academic sector might have in better shaping the good understanding of this vision and the implementation of it. So, but before that, um, uh, Mrs. Eftimescu, Simona, a dear, my dear friend, uh, thank you very much for your patience. And I'm going to uh, immediately pass it uh, to you because it seems to me that uh, you are having a lot of things to build on and also to add to the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially in this uh, uh, company and especially uh, being a part of the Bucharest Forum and of the ASPA network. I'm a very good listener and I'm a very quick uh, talker. So hopefully I'll, I can combine this two to make it a, a brief inter um I was listening to the other panelists uh, and I was nodding and approving of what uh, they were saying. And I realized uh, I have even more more questions now than answers and uh, I feel this might be a side effect of working in academia. However, um, I have to admit that the issues at hand are very challenging and of course difficult to cover in a short amount of time. Um, I have to first state my bias, uh, namely my focus on higher education um, in this context, and I will try to briefly, briefly address three main uh, aspects. Um, the role and mission of education in relation to the labor market, uh, the impact of the current context on education, and um, just touching upon inequality, and as well resilience as one of the core skills for the future. So. Looking from a higher education perspective, um, the first instinct I had uh, when I read the title of the session was to my, my need and my instinct to challenge it uh, because I've been interested in the topic of um, higher education and the mission of higher education and education in general. And in particular, when it comes to universities, uh, they still seem to be torn in between their more traditional missions of teaching and research and the so-called and already very well-known third mission, uh, which is more connected to the economic development and um, regional growth. Um, the risk that I see here is that we become, we as um, actors on, in the academic area, more focused on the employers and on delivering human capital for the labor market. and. Uh, of course, one of the questions that came up uh, for me in the session would be uh, answering as we go forward in debating this, uh, what is the actual responsibility of the educational system? Um, I, for one, I would try to avoid the narrower and limiting para uh, paradigm of uh, getting a degree to get a job. So I'm very happy that uh, the other speakers have also mentioned the uh, balance between life and uh, work and uh, um, have, have also mentioned lifelong learning, uh, not just for the job market, but as an adaptive mechanism um, for, for the future. Uh, of course, uh, we know the world around us is changing at a very fast pace. Um, it means higher education institutions also need to keep up in order to stay relevant. Uh, and we see today, and it was also mentioned in the brief description, description of the session, that um, there are corporate education providers, massive open online courses. Uh, we've just recently found out the um, first artificial intelligence university was created. Uh, big tech companies are disrupting higher education as we know it by implementing career certificates um, instead of um, being interested in cer university certifications or degrees. And it seems to me that the future of work is already here and it's not really waiting for the future of education to, to catch up. Um, in this context, it's a bit of a losing um, proposition for the education system and maybe this is the opportunity we need to redefine uh, the context we work in and uh, um, to redefine its, let's say, um, unique selling proposition. Uh, for the second part, uh, quickly going through it, the, cur the current context, which obviously had a very strong impact on education, uh, and with the risk of uh, embracing a cliche, I would say that disruption is indeed um, uh, an opportunity. And moving to the learning and teaching processes online, uh, which I 
would not necessarily call online education per se, but rather, or at least not yet, um, it opens the way to flexible learning pathways. It challenges the core of what education means, uh, reshapes curricula, gives an opportunity for quality assurance frameworks to be revisited. And uh, it also addresses issues as access and inequality for the better if they're done right or for the worse, um, as it is sometimes the case um, nowadays. Also, uh, when refer referring to the gap in education provision, um, equal opportunity, I believe, should not necessarily be limited uh, only when we discuss access, but also uh, we should um, ensure the fact that achievement and attainment are also uh, regarded as essential uh, when it comes to education provision. Um, I would uh, also mention that, uh, for example, at a general level, um, and it, I know it sounds redundant already, but we must say it often and loud, we must ensure access, fairness, equity, equality at all mm -hmm. levels um, in order to be able to unlock um, so-called intergenerational mobility, social and professional, as well as well-being, health, and uh, of course, wealth. Uh, I won't go into the democratization of higher education as well, which is one step further uh, in trying to reduce social inequalities. Um, just very quickly mentioning the fact that we uh, seem to be on a very fast track training course in resilience, all of us students, teachers, businesses, governments, uh, and resilience, as I was saying in the beginning, is in fact one of the skills that I see necessary uh, for a professional today and even more so for the future. Um, Self-awareness, flexibility, um, uh, healthy self-confidence, curiosity, um, a way of thinking about possibilities and solutions rather than obstacles, and along resilience and all uh, things mentioned, be mentioned before, uh, the so-called soft skills or transferable skills, which have been mentioned before and have been around for a while in theory and practice, uh, I still feel they're the core going further, doubled, of course, by uh, specialized knowledge. And when I say knowledge, I don't mean just knowing content, but rather understanding and being able to interact with it. And finally, um, I was uh, thinking about what uh, the other speakers were, were saying and about setting a vision and um, agreeing upon one. And I was thinking that uh, for what we have witnessed for the past 30 years or so, uh, there are many valuable initiatives, both from civil society and or public institutions uh, that aimed to shape a vision for the future, to create a clear pathway, to better anticipate um, where we are heading. However, um, unfortunately, more often than not, when we have to tackle a current issue, we still resort to what we could uh, name uh, quick fixes. Um, and mm -hmm. it happens particularly in the educational system, uh, which leads to a state of continuous interim, let's say. And my only wish, and I will end with this, is that we, and I say we as in the academic community, the educational system and all the actors involved, don't become so comfortable and so complacent, only talking about the future and planning it, that we start to ignore uh, the present and uh, the things that need to be done today or yesterday. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you Simona. Very much, uh, I very, Simona, I very much uh, appreciated how you ended um, your uh, your brief intervention by saying, "Let's not forget about the present uh, of education, because indeed there are so many uh, so many important things that we have to uh, do with that, and in particular, this issue of access, which has been." Um, so threatened with the pandemic in some of the countries of the European Union, probably more than in other countries where we could see children who couldn't access uh, school because of uh, um, uh, technology, um, lacking technology and so on. So thank you very much to, uh, to you all. Um, I am looking at uh, the chat and I see that uh, we are starting to have a few questions. So a reminder for our um, for our participants, um, uh, please briefly state uh, your uh, identity uh, and your question, possibly uh, as briefly as as, uh, as you can, because otherwise I need to read a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. So the first question that comes in is from um, Gabriel Brezoyu 
who is asking uh, Mrs. Kesaru uh, a question um, about education. Um, he, he is saying education and automation should go together. Uh, and I guess until now we are very um, much agreeing on that. And then the question is, what do you see as the steps needed for training youth in the direction of automation? So I repeat, the steps needed of, for training youth for automation. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Kesaru. Thank you so much. That's, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. So I will talk now about uh, the UiPath perspective, and it's obviously subject to, to a lot of you know, a larger audience, but um, we developed a program called Academic Alliance, where we partner with universities and um, uh, give curricula, give the, the software for free to, uh, to help the, the universities teach automation. So this is actually a program that's happening and it's, it's happening all over the world. So from, from our uh, position, this was a step that, that we wanted to make in order to, to democratize access to uh, learning curricula in, at the university level. And then teachers are, are using the, the, the learning um, materials and, and they are uh, interacting with, with students and, and do a lot of uh, in, interesting things like building robots and, and other stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if there are any insights, uh, any other insights from the other uh, panelists, just um, flag uh, with your hand or with some kind of nonverbal, <laughs> nonverbal sign. Um, uh, we are going next uh, to uh, Mr. Um, Radu Pukyu. Uh, who is asking a question which I think is, yes, is it's mostly addressed to you, uh, Roxana. Um, and actually, maybe it's, uh, it's also for Simona, because uh, I think Simona was the one who mentioned uh, zooming in and zooming out. Am I mistaken? No. No, okay, okay. So uh, he is saying, I totally agree on the zoom in, zoom out approach on learning, but as the learning tends not to be limited at a specific period of time like school and seems to become more and more of a constant part of life, uh, this process of zooming in and out, should it become more of a habit? He's asking, would, would it be appropriate to also learning to unlearn, especially on automated driven processes, biased algorithms, and so on? The questions are addressed to all the speakers, um, um, Ms. Mr. Radio is, um, is saying. So who wants to be the first one to take this very interesting question up? Yep. If I may clarify, because as I can see, he sort of started with with that zooming in and zooming out approach. Uh, it should totally become a habit because learning is not something that you only do at school. It's not something that you only do in trainings. I mean, uh, we should be able to foster within all of us, not just in kids or in students, the capacity to ponder on the things that are unlearned, or that have been learned, that have been learned the right way, that are becoming obsolete. Because if there's one thing that it's toxic, well, at least from my point of view in society, is that saying that it has always been done so. It's the inertia of policy, the inertia of, of processes. So yes, we should also learn to unlearn, but we should also take the time to pause a little bit from the learning process, from the accumulation process, and let things settle down in order for them to be properly understood. Because as I see it right now, we are caught in this storm of learning and learning and learning and learning that by the end of the day, I can't really you know, make a balance and say, this is what I've learned today. So I hope that that answers the question and thank you rather for it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Drobanzo. Anybody else uh, from the panelists who wants to tackle on this? Um, yep, yep, Mr. Tudrake. Okay. 
Uh, hi, thank you. <clears throat> if I understood uh, Radu Pukil's question, uh, whom I salute, by the way, uh, right, um, I think that there is a, something that we also need to factor in, which is, I was mentioning earlier in my introductory speech about our, uh, the, the rewired brains of our, of our kids. Um, and I think that the one aspect that we need to take into account is that they do, they do think differently, they do act differently. What a couple of years ago was seen as a, an exceptional syndrome of not being able to focus attention for more than five minutes in certain kids. And those kids were considered to have an issue and to need to, to address it separately from the rest of the class. I would dare say it becomes, it becomes more and more uh, not an exception, but the norm. Our children have a, a smaller attention span than we used to have. Uh, that has to be factored into the learning uh, method. Uh, we have to adapt the way we, we, uh, we put forward information and we help kids to actually focus. Uh, and it goes also into the zooming in, the zooming out. That ability of zooming in and zooming out comes with goods and with bads. And those consequences, the good and the bad consequences, also, again, need to be factored into the, into the teaching method. So, uh, again, basically the point I want to make, and I don't know if, if uh, again, I understood uh, Radu Pucu's uh, angle right, but the point that I want to make is that somehow, apart from the impact of digitalization, apart from, from everything else, we have to take account of how this new generation is biologically changing uh, the way they relate to the information that is being passed on to them and how it is that they actually develop the mechanisms of learning, of, of sedimenting uh, that, that knowledge that they acquire uh, and also, also afterwards how they actually use it. Because depending mm -hmm. on how you actually put it in, in, in the different drawers of their minds, uh, you would also then uh, build their capacity to use that information, connect the dots and, and package it into those decisions that they need to make or into those, uh, into those arguments or algorithms in their mind which they need to make. Uh, to a large extent, the brains may replicate what happens with, with artificial intelligence, uh, if, I can, if I can make the parallel, um, because there's a, there's a mountain of data that now comes, uh, comes towards us or that we have in front of us, much more than I had when I was a child. When I, had, when I was a child, I had a manual, books uh, on, on the shelves in, in my house. Um, right now, you just click and then you have an Everest of, of data, of information, and you need to figure out as a child how it is that you process that. Mm -hmm. And I think as teachers, I don't dare to, 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 to venture advices for teachers, but as a teacher, I think, again, your, your teaching method has to, has to uh, be adapted to, to that reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Uh, Tudrake. And with eight more minutes to the end, uh, we are taking one more question. Um, uh, and the question comes from uh, Mrs. Uh, Mihaila Drona, uh, and it says like this, age th three to six is very important in setting the values and skills for the long run, especially in education. Are there programs or ideas on how to introduce the preschoolers to digital education, keeping in mind that screen time needs to be very limited for these ages? Are there ways to start with adapted activities as we see in the coding games? So, um, fascinating question. And indeed, um, the, um, this time, the span between three to six uh, years of age, uh, not to mention the previous ones, uh, research says that are very, very important for a child's development. So, um, let us see uh, which of our panelists feel feel feels inspired to uh, try an, an answer to this? And I'm particularly looking at, at you, uh, Simona. Maybe with your psychology-oriented um, uh, background, you might have some insights into this uh, into this question. 
but I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Anybody else who <laughs> who who is uh, who is inspired by the question, please uh, feel free to contribute. Um, thank you. I already turned on my microphone. I felt responsible uh, immediately. <laughs> um, I I will try to connect uh, an attempt of, of an answer to this question, which is a very good question indeed, to the previous one. Um, one of the main skills included in the educational system is learning to learn. And supposedly every single teacher when preparing a, a lesson plan should have this, um, should take this, this into account. Uh, developing and trying to support their students to um, identify the proper mechanisms to learn and of course to unlearn and adapt and readapt. Um, I would mention uh, particularly for this age group, uh, if we talk about psychological um, development and the different levels of development, uh, at this age they're still very, um, I would say very raw. Uh, and we've uh, identified through research done in the Raw Double uh, project, um, aiming at identifying the well being and factors for well being of children in uh, primary uh, school and early education, meaning kindergarten, we tried to identify several factors. And one of the most important factors uh, was interaction. Um, so in my, I would say, non-professional view, um, if we can combine at this early age uh, social interaction with a proper environment for learning and adding in the digital component, which of course is part of their lives from um, the first day, uh, I believe we can have a balanced development of, uh, of this age group. Otherwise, uh, any kind of uh, exaggeration in any direction, of course, um, shouldn't be recommended. I'm not aware of specific programs uh, created for children three to six uh, that are, I don't know, organized uh, in order to, to develop their digital skills. But uh, since um, this year, uh, I believe the uh, let's say grade in kindergarten uh, has started to to become or has become mandatory um, hopefully the teachers in uh, primary and uh, early education will be able to use uh, the digital digital um, components in their teaching process thank you thank you thank you so much uh, simona for, for tackling this question i wonder if there are any other quick uh, insights on this question from any other members of the panel and uh, maybe we can also broaden it uh, in terms of age in the sense that uh, oh okay when i talked when i said the broadening uh, word immediately <laughs> that was a trigger for you um uh, mrs uh, kesaru so i'm curious about your insight so um i think um I think actually that the points that I that I'd like to make uh, might be adapted also to this uh, specific age group, uh, early uh, younger one. But uh, I'm not a specialist, so this is why I don't want to 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 make any specific comments. But I want what I want to bring in is uh, the need to have um, programs for um, educating kids on on cyberbullying or what can that be. On, on fake news and uh, making sure that they understand their privacy and how you know they, they can protect themselves and guard themselves from from possible you know attacks and, and other uh, forms of, uh, of um, invasion in, in their privacy world so I think um, uh, this these are important um, components that a digital literacy program, has to include and um, the digital education action plan at the European Commission is also pointing towards these and probably the revised version will also um, mention them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, um, Mrs. Casaro. So it seems that we only have, according to my watch, uh, two more minutes, the last uh, two minutes of, uh, of our time together. And it seems to me that uh, while we um, uh, provided many answers to the fascinating questions of the panel, we also formulated new questions um, uh, to be developed probably in the future. One of the um, uh, most fascinating questions that I'm taking uh, out of this is this in terms of how do we um, formulate the, the vision, how do we share it among all the stakeholders 
um, emphasizing uh, Mrs. Casario's uh, uh, multi-stakeholder approach, and then how we implement it in a way which is bringing STEM and STEAM together, ending psychology uh, factors that uh, uh, Simona mentioned uh, a few times, um, and so on. Uh, before we uh, are uh, going, each of us to continue our days, I would like to thank you uh, very much for your presence today. I would like to thank the participants and those who uh, addressed questions and uh, were here with us in this uh, at this virtual table. And before we go, I only have one last um, uh, thing, one last, it's not a question, one last thing that I would like each of us to uh, to share with our participants. And that is one word, possibly that is summarizing for you the spirit of this panel and uh, one thing one important thing that you took away as panelists from this panel because you are here to share uh, from your wisdom but at the same time also to enrich your own wisdom by listening to the others and to the questions so if possible one word and if it's not possible i give you three but not more than that <laughs> So what is what, that word that is summarizing uh, for you the experience of sharing and gaining wisdom from our panel today? Who is the brave one to break the ice? Yep. I can, say, I can say once again, and don't blame me for it, multi-stakeholder approach. Multi-stakeholder approach, that is fast, uh, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Who goes next? Um, I see Mr. Tudrake is attempting, <laughs> trying, okay. Well, if it is to be one word, I would say transformation. Transformation. Thank you very much. And now we have Professor Drobansu and uh, Simona. Uh, I will go with hope. Because it's oh, been such a I like that. <laughs> I like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Simona? Uh, my word was transformation. I'll just go with change. <laughs> change. Okay. You took you actually took my word because as a behavior change advisor, change is constantly on my mind. And the question for me is how do we promote those behavior changes that are going to make um, education the education for the future? With that said, I would like to thank you all for your um, very wise uh, participation, for sharing your thoughts with us. And um, that said, um, it's, it has been a pleasure and an honor. And I'm greeting you all and the participants listening to us from their homes or offices, wherever you are in, uh, in the world. Uh, it has been a pleasure and we invite you to attend other um, uh, panels uh, in the remaining of the forum. Uh, this is one of the last days and then see you again next year, maybe um, with who knows what new technology. So have a nice day, everybody. It has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.